Masechet Shekalim, Daf Yud Gimel. We're going to complete the fourth perek with a few last points of some technical halachot, and then we're going to begin the fifth perek with some very interesting and important agadot. So we begin with a story about Chavreya B'Shem Rabbi Yochanan. Some of the students in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Aibu Barnik Nagri Amar Kome Rabbi Ila B'Shem Rabbi Yochanan. Okay, so these also these students in the name of Rabbi Yochanan said, Tama Dehen Tanya. Okay, they're explaining something that we saw yesterday. I mentioned yesterday, three three way If someone takes a nekeva animal and designates it to be an Ola Pesach or Asham. All those three types of animals have to be zahar. So you have a problem by taking in a keva animal and designate it as such. If someone does that, what happens? Well, the Tanakhama says it works anyway, and those animals um, can can uh, get kiddushat haguf, such that if you make a substitution, it will substitute the, the other animal, will also get kiddushat haguf. Second opinion was that of Rabbi Shimon, uh, who said an ola, for an ola, that does get, get kiddushat haguf. Um, but not the other two. And the last opinion would be Shimon ben Yehuda says none of the three get Kiddushat HaGuf, only Kiddushat Mamon. So we're going to cite, uh, attempt to cite a source for the third opinion. And it comes from Vayikra, the, uh, the end of the last pedic in Vayikra, uh, which says that Tanya, um, uh, the full pasuk talks about a behemat teme'a, does that mean tema? Could, could mean a lot. It could, could mean not kosher. Could mean it's actually impure or somehow unfit. Uh, well, that's what we're going to discuss. And so, what happens if someone does that and, and tries to uh, designate it as a sacrifice? It does not. You do not bring it as a sacrifice, but rather you stand it before the priest, and the priest will assess how much it's worth, and then the person will have to pay that amount. So now we ask, what does it mean that it's unclean? Is it going to mean that it's actually not a, not a non-kosher animal? I can't mean that because the Pasuk later on, 27, Pasuk 27 of Pedic 27, that actually talks explicitly about that case. Rather, it's talking about something that is unclean, meaning unsuitable for that particular category of sacrifice. So here we go. Nekeva uh, is... Um, unsuitable for any of these three categories, Ola, Pesach, Hashem, and that's why uh, you do not sacrifice it. So therefore you see, um, you pay instead, so that's Kiddushat Mamon, not Kiddushat Teguf. All right, that's the proof of the students of Rabbi Yochanan. However, Gemara has a question, that doesn't make sense because if something is really uh, unfed and uh, just gets monetary, then you just go and sell it on the, at, at the market. You don't have to go through this whole process of a Kohen coming and assessing it, evaluating it, that only applies to something that actually once had Kiddushat HaGuf and then maybe became, uh, got a mum in it. So that the, the ending of the Pasuk doesn't really fit what you're trying to prove. Rather, we, prep, we can try to use the same Pasukim to prove the Bishim On's opinion, the middle one. Uh, and that's what Rabbi Zeira, Bishim Rabbi El Azad is going to do. Lo Amar Ken, Elas, no, no, don't say that, but rather uh, use the Pasuk for as follows. It seems that he's deriving from the doubling in the pasuk of something that cannot be sacrificed as a sacrifice to Hashem. Uh, why the doubling of the word sacrifice, sacrifice? So it means something that cannot be sacrificed, not in this category and not in any other category. That's something that... Um, that will that you can just uh, uh, sell uh, that gets only kedushat mamon uh, that would apply for example to uh, to the other pesach and hasham. However, yasat nekeva leola af al pi shenadu yel li kadev kanda ud li kadev makom macher. But this would not include uh, someone that takes a, a nekeva animal as an ola because even though this animal cannot be uh, sacrificed as an ola, a bird that you bring as a nekeva can be sacrificed as an ola. So therefore, since it is within the category in some place, um, the Kiddushat Teguf will apply to it. Uh, however, we're going to question this as well. To be abun, to be to be bon, ba'on, komer, bi za'ira. We have a question uh, to the Bizera, because after all, if an animal is involved in bestiality, 
then that animal can never become be, be a kurban, not here, not any place, nowhere. And yet, um, if someone tries to designate as a kurban, it will get kiddushat aguf and it will make, uh, if you ever substitute um, a copy of it, uh, also with kiddushat aguf. And so there, that is a, um, an example that goes against the rule that they just derived. So that can't be. So it means that I was going to try to explain this pasuk differently. Just as though you're right. No, I really just meant that. Uh, and so it seems to be backtracking from what he just said here, but the Gemara doesn't accept that either. Because yeah, but that could be the If it's actually an unkosher animal, then would you have to say that the Kohen goes? Never have such a thing. And in any case, there's another pasuk that talks about that, uh, the non kosher animal. And therefore, the Vizyada's proof is uh, is, is uh, disproven. And that's how we end the discussion of that Mishnah. Now, the last Mishnah of the fourth critic says, Achat uh, yom et halishka. Once every 30 days, um, we set the, the prices. Uh, the market price of uh, in the in the in the Beit Hamikdash. In other words, amount that they are going to, the price that they're going to buy and sell all the different um, uh, uh, materials, the uh, the oil, the flour, the wine, uh, are are set each month. Here's how it works. If someone, a provider, a uh, supplier, accepts upon himself to give solet, right, the fine flour uh, for a uh, four sela per sela, and that's the price that you agreed to, then let's say it gets more expensive, and now um, you have to pay, uh, it's only a three sela per sela. The supplier agreed to the price of four per sela and therefore has to provide that amount, right? And can even though, even though the market price outside the Beth Mikdash went down. On the other hand, if uh, they agreed that uh, the, uh, the uh, at the set price at the beginning of the month, that would be three sela per sela, and then it got cheaper. And now you can, now the market price is four sela per sela, then the supplier has to give the more, right, the, the cheaper price. Um, so in other words, the supplier always has, has, the, has, to, pay the, has, has to pay more, has to pay the difference. The treasury um, has the upper hand in all cases. Um, so that's the, uh, uh, you know, the Beth Mitash was a good uh, customer. They bought, bought in bulk and you were sure that they were to pay. Uh, but the others, uh, other side of it is that whether it goes up or, up or down, uh, the Beit Hamikdash gets the benefit of that. If the fine flour got worms in it, then the supplier has to uh, take it back and uh, and uh, replace. And, if, and wine that he provided turns into vinegar. It's the supplier that eats the cost. Basically, he cannot, he does not receive or actually earn his his money until the it's uh, the until whatever he provided is actually um, given on the mizbeach. So it has to has to get to the end, uh, and in order for the supplier to get his money. This doesn't mean that he doesn't technically get his money because the Gemara will explain. Actually, the uh, Kohanim would pay immediately uh, when, uh, as soon as they, as soon as they could, and the Kohanim are actually very careful to make sure that nothing would spoil, so they didn't have to worry. But if it did spoil, then uh, they, the uh, supplier would have to replace the item that he was already paid for. All right, and now we get to the fifth perek. Uh, which is going to begin with the different officials who are in charge of various jobs in the Beit HaMikdash and gives us their actual names. That's going to list uh, 15 people. Elohen HaMimunim Shayu BaMikdash. Yochanan Ben Pinechas Al HaChotamot. Yochanan was in charge of the seals or basically receipts. Uh, whenever someone would come and they say, you know, that we're going to uh, want to buy a, a certain item, they would give him a receipt and they would go to uh, uh, to the next uh, booth and receive what they wanted. And so all those receipts were collected by Yochanan ben Pinchas, who would have to uh, balance the books and make sure everything was correct. 
Achia also he had to be a very trustworthy person. Achia al hanesachim. Achia was was responsible for the wine libations to uh, uh, to prepare them and make sure that they were um, appropriate and kosher. Achia ben Shmuel al hapaisot. Achia was in charge of the lotteries. Uh, there were kohanim. Everybody wanted to serve and do all the all the jobs. So there were lotteries every day to decide which kohen would perform each job. So he had to be very responsible. Petachia al hakinin. Petachia was a very important job. He was in charge of all the bird offerings, and those are the, the laws of those are extremely complicated. Uh, so he had to oversee. Um, every people would come and they would put some coins in a in, in a basket for uh, for that purpose. And so he would have to make sure that they were all done correctly. Petachia, this person who was in charge of the birds, dehu mordechai. Uh, his actual name was Mordechai. Uh, so it says here is from the book of uh, the same Mordechai is from the book of Esther. I don't think necessarily has to be like because it looks like the others are all from uh, later times, as the Gemara will explain. Uh, but the point is that his actual name was Mordechai, but his nickname was Petachia because he would uh, uh, unravel or be able to elucidate. Uh, unlock word potech in tenetic sources do not mean to begin, but rather to uh, to open like a, a difficult topic uh, to explain. So he would explain uh, the uh, uh, words of Torah and uh, and um, announce them, interpret them, um, and he knew also seventy languages. So that way, you know, anyone who came with any any uh, issue problem, he would be able to understand them, translate. And so he resolved lots of difficult problems. Okay, Ben Achia al Chole Me'ayim. Ben Achia was the uh, doctor of the house, and if the Kohen ever got sick from uh, intestinal disease, he knew how to solve that. Mechunya Chofer Shichin. Mechunya was the well digger, make sure that there's enough water for the people that would uh, come. Gebini Karoz, Gebini was the temple crier. He would make announcements, everybody, you know, Kohanim, Leviim, it's time to start, you know, do this, do that, wake them up. Ben Gevet on the Ilat Sha'arim, this uh, person named Ben Gevet, he locked the gates and uh, at night and opened them up in the morning. An important job. Ben Bevai Mimune al Hapakia. Ben Bevai was in charge of the shreds of garments when uh, uh, the big uh, the clothing of the of the kohen would get worn out. They would turn them into wicks for the uh, menorah, and so he knew how to uh, prepare those wicks. Ben Aza al Hasil Sal. Ben Aza was for the symbols that they would uh, ring to start, so that the levim would start the song. Hugras Ben Levi al Hashir, and Hugras uh, was the uh, responsible for the singers. The basically the conductor of the temple singers. Bet Garmu Amase Lechem Hapanim. Bet Garmu knew how to make the Lechem Hapanim, the 12 loaves that they would exchange every Shabbat, had to be made in a special way. They had the secret formula. Bet Abtinas Amase Haketoret. Bet Abtinas, we met, we, uh, met already. Um, they knew the secret formula of how to make the, the Ketoret for the Bet Abtinash each day. El Azar Ala Parochet. Azar took care of the curtains in the Bet Abtinash. Finchas Amalbish. Finchas. Uh, took care of all of the clothing for the Kohanim, made sure uh, they fit well and they were always uh, kept in good shape. Okay, so we mentioned all these people. Now, uh, obviously the Beit HaMikdash was, uh, was up for hundreds of years, so it wasn't the same person that was in charge of them all the time. So why are we mentioning only these, these one, one, one name for each of these jobs? So that's the opening of the Gemara. Amar Rabbi Simon Berabanan, uh, so these two sages are Gionis Khadamar Keshere Dor Vador Badim not Adehen. one says that this is the uh, the the ones that were kosher, the best of every generation uh, were mentioned here, right? So these are the 15 people here are not all contemporaries, but rather uh, the top people uh, from whatever generation they were are mentioned uh, for good here. The second opinion is that this Tana, whoever, whoever said this Mishnah, was enumerating all the people that were in his generation. Uh, so this uh, actually obviously means that the Rabbi Udanasi, although he compiled, he concluded the Mishnah, he did not write the Mishnayot, um, neither did Rabbi Akiva before him, because both of those sages lived after the time of the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, but rather, this is an old Mishnah, and uh, so wherever, whenever it dates from, however old it is, uh, the Tanah that recorded these names 
these were happened to be the officiants that were in his time, uh, whether they were the best or, or, or mediocre or not. Um, this is, just happens to be his contemporaries. Now, Now, based on this Malachlok, we can explain something else, which is Mishnah and Yomad, two Mishnah and Yomad that talk about a whole list of people that are mentioned for praise and a whole list of other people that are mentioned for censure, they did something wrong. And the three of the people that are, that are in this Mishnah that we just read are mentioned there also for censure. So, well, uh, according to the first opinion we're saying here, the one who says that this is the best of every generation, uh, of, of all, all generations, so then you have to say about all these people, Zeche Sadiq Libracha. Uh, so this uh, may argue with the Tana and Yoma, or maybe explaining that Mishnah differently, that um, that uh, the people that are mentioned for bad are not these, there are other people in the in, in that Mishnah, other people in the list, but the, all these people are mentioned for good. However, according to the second opinion here, that this Tana meant, just happened to mention all the people that were alive in this generation, and some were good and some were bad. So then all three that are mentioned in the Mishnah in Yoma uh, must be the ones that we say are remembered for bad. And about them, we say the name of the wicked shall rot. And so who, who is mentioned actually for good is the people in the first Mishnah there. One of them was Ben Katin. Uh, he improved the basin for the Kohanim and uh, others. Okay, so based on these two opinions here, we can interpret the Mishnah over there of who did a good job and who did not. All right, now Amud Bet, Amar Biona Ketiv, Rachen Achalek Lob Rabim Bet Asunim Yachalek Shalal. This pasuk from Yeshaya 53, this is a famous pedic uh, uh, known as the suffering servant, uh, uh, which is um, in Peshat, uh, a, um, a, a metaphor for all the Bnei Israel who suffer greatly for, um, for, for the world. Um, but uh, here, this Miskimara says it's referring to uh, Christians, uh, take that, uh, you have a field day with this pedic. Um, but the rabbis here say this is referring to specifically the Biakiva, Zer Biakiva, Shitkin Midrash Valachot Ba Agadot. So the, the suffering servant goes on and says he bared his soul until, his de until death. So that's one reason why he's associated with the Biakiva, who was a martyr. But furthermore, that he took great things and he divided them. And so uh, the, he, here he's talking about not money, but rather all of the Torah Shebe uh, Alpe, which was uh, just uh, was remembered by by many people in all different ways. No set curriculum; it's very very difficult to learn. Uh, not all disorganized, and so he came and he set everything forth. Uh, midrash, meaning um, how to how to derive uh, laws from the Torah, halachot, more in the form of Mishnah, uh, Abedic law, just in order. And Agadot also, so he collected and arranged all of them. So that's one interpretation. And others say, no, these Midrash, Halachot, and Agadot, those were arranged by the men of the Great Assembly. So rather, what did the Akiva add to it, uh, who came after them? Um, introduced the interpretive method known as Pelal Ufrat. Whenever in the Torah you have a general and then a specific, um, what, how do you interpret that? So he was a master of that uh, form of interpretation. So now that we're talking about uh, people that uh, were involved in the transmission of Torah, um, so we mentioned another group called the Sofrim, and in Divrei uh, Amim, I mentioned this group, the, the families of the Sofrim. So who are they? Okay, so fed, we, 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 know, we know means a scribe, um, but it has other meanings as well. And here it can mean the counters. So they took all of the halachot of the Torah and they put them in groups and counted them as, as, uh, as lists. And that way it would be easier to organize and easier to memorize. Here's a few examples of uh, counts that we actually do find in the Mishnah, Hamisha, Lo Yitromu, Teruma, uh, five uh, people that may not separate Teruma, Hamisha, Devim, Chayim, Bechala, or five different types of grain. One has to bring Chala, um, same five that uh, you'd have to you know, be a Sura and Pesach if you make him Chamet and so on. Hamesh is an Ashim Kotrot, Sarot, Tehen, and Masechet Yevamot. 
uh, 15 types of relations between people where um, they do not have to do yibum. 36 items that if one does your chayav karet, uh, 13 laws that are mentioned regarding a, an animal that it be, was, was killed as a nevela. Four types of um, damages. And the, the uh, primary categories of work on Shabbat are 39. So these are all ways of counting things so that we can uh, remember them and organize them. Okay. Another person who's called a sofer is Ezra. Um, and so he is, uh, says in the Pasuk regarding him, actually says the word sofer twice in the same Pasuk explaining him. So how, you know, what way is he a sofer twice over? So the first one, which is the simple uh, simple meaning, is that he was a sofer in Divrei Torah. He's the one, after all, that brought the Sefer Torah from Babel to Eretz Yisrael. So he's an expert in the uh, in the, the wording and explanation of, of the Torah, um, Torah Shebikhtav. But besides that, also, sofer in Divrei Chamim, he was able to recount the oral law. Rabbi Chagai v'shem Rabbi Shem El Bar Nachman, Harishonim Charshu v'Zaru Nikeshu Kisechu Adru Kasru Amru Dashu Zaru Bariru Tachanu Hirkidu Lashu Kitfu Ve'Afu Ve'Anu En Ve'Anu Ma'le Ma'le Echol. Amazing statements is the early scholars because they had to work through Torah uh, Shabbalpe, and I was giving a metaphor for all the steps you'd need to do in order to make baked bread. It takes a tremendous amount of work, including a lot of it is separating the bad from the good and taking out uh, all the uh, the. Um, uh, impurities uh, to get the finest bread. So they worked very hard to make Torah Shabbat uh, accessible, tangible, understandable. And yet, even though they did all that work, we still have nothing to eat. In other words, uh, still uh, acquiring Torah is so difficult to do despite the best efforts of those generations. Imagine if they didn't do that, how much more difficult it would be. Rabbi Abba, Bar Zemina Beshem Rabbi Zaira in Havun Kadma in Malachin, Anan, Bene and Ash, Vin Havun Bene and Ash, Anna, Davun Bene and Ash, Anan Hamadin, famous statement that if the early generations were like angels, then we are only human. And if we think that the early generations were human, then we are but donkeys. Uh, this is a famous statement regarding Yid, Yiridat Hadoroti. At the descent of generations, every generation um, gets lower and lower, and less and less understanding. And don't think that uh, someone could be a donkey, you know, like a like a like a great donkey, but not like the great donkey of Rabbi Mechaber not even as great as his donkey. Okay, now that we mentioned uh, his, rather, if you think that the early generations were humans, then you'd be just like a regular donkey. Okay, now what was so special about the famous donkey of Rabbi Bilchas ben Yair? Here's the famous story. One time, a robber came and stole his donkey at night. So they kept it hidden with them for three days, but the donkey refused to eat anything. So after three days, they said, well, we better return it because we don't want it to die over here. And, you know, there's, it'll uh, bring a stench to their hiding place. They're hiding in some cave. So they uh, let it go and it went and found its way back to his master's gate and was praying. Um, so, um, so Rabbi Mecha said, quick, open the door. So he's open up the Poor, poor thing, it didn't, uh, hasn't eaten in three days. So they opened and it entered the courtyard. So give us something to eat quick. So they gave it barley, animals like barley, and would not eat. 
I mean, let it be. I don't know. They said, Rabbi, you just want to eat. Amalon, metukanin inun. So, did you take ma'asir, right? Did you uh, fix it? In other words, did you make sure that this is kosher produce? Amrun le in. Yes, we did. Amalon, ve'arim tun damyan. How about the part of the produce that was uh, demai? It was un unsure uh, if it was, you got it from an ama'arit. So, we can presume that probably he did. But uh, we're not not for sure. Did you make sure to take ma'asir from that section also? Says, no, we didn't, because after all, you taught us that if you're giving feeding the food to an animal or using flour to uh, to prepare hides uh, for tanning, or if you're taking oil just to burn and not to eat, then you don't have to take the ma'asir from demai. Uh, these are low-level usages, and so you can use them as is. And here we're we're feeding it to an animal, so it should be fine. You're right. You do know the halacha, but what should we do with this poor animal? That it's very machmir on itself. So they did take the tithe from the demai, and then it would eat. There's a Play on words here that this uh, hamor is mahmir on itself, right? It is very stringent. Okay, so um, uh, a person who uh, doubts the knowledge of previous generations is not even going to be at the level of this uh, of this uh, hamor of Ripin Chasben Yair. Okay, fun story. Now back to back to the list of uh, of, of temple officiants. Petachya al hakinin. Petachos are responsible for the birds. Bore magadol hu kochos shelotu aish. Right, so noting how amazing it is that he, this uh, this uh, individual, was able to unravel, expound matters, and uh, explain them in public. He knew seventy languages, which is representative of all the all the languages of the world. Um, now, in order to be a judge on the Sanhedrin, one also needs that. Uh, that knowledge. However, not everybody has to have the same uh, and on the same level. It's very something very difficult to do. Uh, the Sanhedrin has two people that can speak every language. They have active knowledge of the language, and the rest of the 68, they have passive knowledge. They can understand it, even if they can't speak it. So that's okay. That's worthy. At least you have two people. Shiloshah had is open, and you have three people that can speak all 70 languages. Then that's a, a medium uh, level Sanhedrin. Alba had is chachama. But that's considered a wise sentence. So you never had a sentence that everyone is on the same level. Everybody knows 70 languages. Um, four is considered great. In fact, in Yavne, the great sentence in there, they had four people that can speak every language. Who were they? Ben Azai, Ben Zama, Ben Chachinai, Verbi El Azar, Ben Matya. Amar Bichista, Pamachat Yavesha, El Tistel, Veloya Dun, Mehechan, Mehavi, Omer. So now they're going to talk about the uh, uh, the, the greatness of this Petachia, who knew 70 languages, even knew uh, some kind of sign language or charades. Uh, so here's a story. Uh, one time there was a great drought in Eretz Yisrael, and so they couldn't, they had nowhere to bring the barley for the Omer sacrifice on Pesach. Uh, so they didn't know what to do, where they're going to get this barley. Baba Taman Hadilem. There happened to be someone there who was a mute and he, he couldn't speak. Baba Yaheb Had Al Gagot and Al Serifim. And so he, uh, he with one hand he pointed to roofs and the other hand he pointed to huts. And so he's trying to sign some some kind of a hint to where you could find barley. So no one could understand what he was saying, but they brought him to this individual Petachia, who was uh, so wise, Amar Lehu, it atar mekriya gagot, sirifin, o sirifin gagot, azalina taman bashkachan. So he says, well, look, he's pointing to roofs and huts. So um, he's not saying that you can find in roofs and huts, but think of the, the, the words. If you put together those words, is there any place around that's called uh, the gagot sirifin, or sirifin gagot? And sure enough, yes, there was. There's a place called sirifin. Here's the map, and it's uh, right over here. Uh, near Rishon the Sion, they went there. Sure enough, they found that there was actually Omid Bali there. Okay, great story. This story is also found in the Tamud Bavli. Tamud Bavli is not talking about a case of a drought, but rather the result of um, of a war. There was a siege between the two sons of Shalom Sion Hamalka, the two Hashmonaim, and they were fighting over who was going to be the next uh, next king. And so one besieged the other, 
and they were going on for a long time until the uh, one of the elders inside said uh, to the people outside, listen, as long as you're providing animals for the Beta Mikdash, you'll never be able to take the city. And so and, uh, one, one day, instead of sending up an animal, they sent a pig and the pig scratched into the wall of the of Yerushalayim and caused an earthquake around uh, all of the all of the surrounding areas. And that's why they couldn't bring an Ahmed. And then it brings this story as well about the person who was able to uh, sign. Okay, but anyway, we have this, actually the same signs, just different circumstances uh, here in the Yerushalmi. So another time, the whole world, before we had Ez Yisrael here, the whole world uh, had a, a problem, a blight, and they had no barley to, to use for the Ahmed. Again, it was a certain mute person, put one hand on his eye and other other hand on the door jam. I tune in the gabe petachia. Again, good. It's a good thing petachia was there. Amalon ita ta demit karia ein socher or socher ein. He understood. He's pointing to uh, uh, words that sound like the place. So, is there any place? He he knew he knew um, he knew sign language. Just didn't know geography. Uh, so, is there any place like this? Avazun taman dashkechun. Yes, sure enough, there was a place. There is a place called Ein Socher, and here it is on the map. We can identify it today. And sure enough, they were able to find the barley there. Okay, uh, yet another story. In fact, he was uh, Pitachia was in charge of the birds, uh, the bird offerings, and one of the people that brings a bird offering is a zava. So here you have a case. Shalosh nashim heviu kinehen. There were three women, and they brought their pairs of birds to the Beit Hamikdash. And uh, they said, you know, what are they for? They just said one word. One said for my fountain, one said for my sea, and one said for my ziva. So, so anyone else would have assumed that they're all actually zavot, and that's why they bring the birds, but Petachia knew better. One who said, I'm bringing this for my uh, uh, um, uh, fountain. Uh, so everyone assumed that it means that they had a uh, blood flow like a fountain and continued past the Nidas time, and therefore there's Zava, and that's why they're bringing it. However, Petachia explained no, she was in danger in a fountain. She fell into a fountain and uh, you know she was saved. So she's actually bringing these birds as a Thanksgiving offering. Uh, so he understood her, her, her intention correctly. And the other woman said, this is for my sea. They thought that also that meant that she was, uh, she saw blood past her nida uh, time. So therefore she was a zavab. And in fact, she was in danger and she, she almost drowned and she was saved. So she was bringing these birds as thanksgiving offerings. Now zivati is the clearest one that says, you know, she, for my flow, uh, so it seems like that she is uh, definitely a zava. Amalon ze'ev balitol et benai. Says no. What she meant is that because uh, ziva sounds like ze'ev, a wolf uh, tried to come and snatch her son, but was saved. And she's also bringing it as a Thanksgiving offering. And so it's important to know because the details of how to bring it are going to be are going to be different. So you need someone like Petachia who can uh, almost read people's minds and know what they're thinking uh, in order to be in charge of this important job. Okay, and lastly for the staff, Ben Achia, uh, he was uh, he was the doctor and treated people for the uh, for their stomach aches. So why the why were the Kohanim getting stomach aches? First of all, you're not allowed to wear shoes in the Beit Hamikdash, no marble floors, which are cold. So they, uh, so that's not good for their health. They would get cold feet. They would eat a lot of meat. And they would drink water. Why are they drinking water? Well, you're not allowed to drink wine when you're on the job. Uh, as a Kohen, you can't drink wine in Beit Hamikdash. So they drank water, but uh, the water in those days had a lot of bacteria in it. Uh, so that's uh, the most likely where they got these stomach aches. They mainly de cholera ma'ayim, and that would give them uh, intestinal disease. And Achia, he knew. Uh, what was uh, what, what was um, uh, particularly good uh, wine to uh, to drink that would uh, help with intestinal and other kinds of uh, um, uh, things to drink that would help them uh, to um, uh, against their intestinal uh, disease uh, by drinking those that these types of wine and uh, tomorrow we'll see uh, more of the temple officiants and more stories about them.
ברוך אדוני לעולם, אמן ואמן.